Please pray with me. Gracious and loving God, help us this day to understand and celebrate your dream for the world, to be transformed in Jesus' love, and to use our gifts to make a difference for others. Amen. Today, I have to talk to you about sheep. It's Good Shepherd Sunday, the 23rd Psalm Sunday. Every fourth Sunday of Easter, the appointed reading comes from John, where Jesus describes himself as the Good Shepherd. And this is why today, I have to talk to you who live in the Bay Area, in cities and suburbs, apartments, who work in tech or nursing or schools or law or banking. I have to talk to you about sheep. There is so much sheep and shepherdry imagery in our scripture due to where and when it was written that forget about learning Greek and Hebrew in seminary. Part of a priest's education should have been working on a sheep ranch. But you know, this priest got lucky. My sister-in-law spent most of her career working on a sheep ranch as a shepherd. From all the stories she shared with me over the years, this I know. Sheep are extremely vulnerable. For instance, sheep really do need that still water. The way they're it's not just a nice image because the way their noses are constructed, they can't drink from fast running river water. It's got to be still. She would always have good and gruesome stories of sheep getting caught in the mud or getting lost, wandering into crevices that they couldn't get out of. Sheep need a lot of help. They really do need those sheep dogs. And especially, sheep need those shepherds, really good shepherds, to survive. Jesus is saying he is the good shepherd. And he's saying this about himself because of what just happened in the passage before this one we hear. Jesus has encountered a young adult born blind. He heals this blind young man, and the young man, now with full sight, returns to his home community, and he is greeted not with awe, joy, and congratulations, but with a trial for wrongdoing. The officials are angry with him for getting his sight back on the Sabbath, and they interrogate him. Really, they're angry livid with Jesus, very resentful of him, but he's currently too powerful with his popularity with the crowd, so they go for the weaker one, the young adult, whose only crime was to receive a miracle. And in classic bully fashion, they chase him out of town. Jesus hears about this and goes to find the young man and brings him back. The young man had become vulnerable because he no longer fit the community's system. The day of the week being more important than the young person. So Jesus acted as a good shepherd and brought him into the fold as a disciple. When you don't fit into the system, it makes you vulnerable to the abuse of others. Julie Lithcott Haynes found herself extremely vulnerable growing up biracial, presenting as black in a white school system. In a Fresh Air podcast this past week, she shared a story from her memoir, A Real American, that 30 years later, she still, her voice still quavered with emotion at the retelling of it. Even though she was literally the only person of color in this Wisconsin high school. 
she ended up being very popular and highly successful as a student and in leadership. Elected to student leadership, she recalled how her wonderful best friend decorated her locker on her birthday with a beautiful poster, with loving, beautiful words and images that represented how this friend felt toward her and to give her this esteem of how wonderful a person she was. And so Julie felt loved and special, and she returned to her locker in the afternoon, looked at that great, beautiful poster, birthday greeting, and on it, in little corners where there were spaces between words and pictures, was in black Sharpie, written the worst racial slur you could receive as an African American. So Julie felt this stab in her heart. She felt shame and thought, I really don't belong. Her response was to silently march into the school office where she spent a lot of time as a student leader. No one questioned her why or asked why she wasn't in class or what she was up to. She found a black Sharpie, went back to her birthday greeting poster on her locker and made little squares around the ugly words and marked them out where they were written over and over and over again, just black them out. She never, ever told anyone about the deep wound. Not her best friend, not her parents, not her teachers, no one. Until 30 years later. She took that poster home, buried it deep away in her, where it remained as a reminder of her shame and the prevalent sense that she didn't belong anywhere. She told the interviewer, if only there had been one teacher, one adult, who had come to me when I arrived at that all-white school and named my vulnerability. Hey, you're the only black person in this white school. If you ever have any trouble or weirdness, come to me. I'll support you. I'll listen. I'm here. She said, maybe I wouldn't have just buried it away for 30 years and let it grow as shame. Julie Lithgott Haynes needed a good shepherd. I know, we love this Sunday of Good Shepherd readings and we love the 23rd Psalm because we all see ourselves as sheep as the vulnerable. And we all feel so comforted by the gorgeous images of a God who leads us to green pastures and still waters. A God who brings us home, who guides us with rod and staff, who always pursues us. When Jesus gathered the disciples in the breaking of the bread on Monday, Thursday, he said to them, you are no longer my servants. You are my friends. Love one another as I have loved you. Jesus keeps coming to us in our worship and gatherings of Holy Communion and says to us, you are no longer my servants. You are my friends. Love one another as I have loved you. We know in his first letter to the new Christian community how John reminds this new group of this commission of Jesus. In 1 John, he says, we know love by this, that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for one another. 
Yes, we're sheep. But Jesus made us good shepherds. Not only to see the vulnerable and to name the vulnerable, but to intercede and break the rules, the system, crush it up, and lay down our lives for the vulnerable. We are so practiced at not being vulnerable. Our world, our society doesn't like vulnerability. We, we literally arm ourselves with real weapons against it. What did Jesus say? The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Donella Frazier, a 17-year-old with a phone, and her nine-year-old cousin in tow were good shepherds. They are forever changed, wounded from what they witnessed in the death of George Floyd. They even laid down their lives again and re-entered the pain of that day by testifying in Derek Chauvin's murder trial. Good shepherds make themselves vulnerable for the vulnerable. To lay down our lives for the sheep is to give up something of ourselves. It's giving away, opening up, and expanding, and being courageous even though we are vulnerable. As church, Christ has given us each other. When we are church together, we can dare to be vulnerable with each other. We weep on Zoom, express our fears and hurts, admit we don't have it all together. We risk saying the wrong thing and ask forgiveness to lay down our instinct, to stay armored, and in that vulnerability, to know real life. At the feast we share with one another, we can receive the gift of Jesus, the Good Shepherd, leading us. So, when we were out in the world of wolves and hired hands, we need to reimagine ourselves, not as sheep, but as good shepherds who stand between the wolves and the vulnerable ones. When we follow Christ, we need to remember that we're not just sheep. We are here to become vulnerable for the vulnerable. Not to run away at the earliest signs of danger. Jesus needs shepherds as much as he needs sheep.